All right. Thank you, Tammy. I'd like to know who you are after I give you a little bit about who I am. So we'll take that. We got extra time, so we'll take it. Um, a couple of the questions in the survey that you had taken about what you wanted to hear about, creating an impact and influence others, uh, conflict resolution, effective communication in a primary, primarily male field, those are the things that prompted me to think about redirecting disagreements. Do you ever have any disagreements? Yeah, that's pretty normal in the world of business. So um, I just want you to know that I've been working with communication for over 30 years and have been uh, studying how people communicate and researching neuroscience. I'm a brain nerd. I want to know how it works. And we've learned about how it creates our thinking and creates what we look at as reality. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that. First of all, who would be willing to say where you're from and what piqued your curiosity? Or anything you want to. Hi, I'm Susan. And um, I'm just concluding a job search and I'll be starting a new job in two weeks. And throughout the interview cycle, yeah, hooray. Yeah. <laughs> um, throughout the interview cycle, I always got the question about resolving conflicts and addressing disagreements. And in my previous work, I really didn't experience much of it. So now I'm concerned that I'm going into an environment where I'm going to be starting to encounter disagreements and I don't have practice with it. So that was okay. my interest. Okay, great. I have a good book recommendation for your self-study. Good. I'm good. just introducing you to a process. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Who else? Hi, my name is Laura. I'm from California. Um, I am in, hi, I'm in senior management and, you know, our team has gelled pretty good right now, but there is this hierarchy of who's going to win the conversation. Um, and we're introducing two new people in a month. And I can just see that's going to introduce, you know, a lot more ideas, a lot more um, topics that we need to discuss. And I don't know if the team is ready for it. And I need to try to make sure that I'm ready to facilitate that discussion. Oh, great. Good for you to look forward like that. Thank you. Who else? Hi, I'm Amanda. Um, I'm based in San Antonio, Texas. And um, I've been dealing with um, just a lot of change in the organization and um, a lot of times that means that there's different interests that pop up because there's uh, new folks coming in or um, the ones uh, there's some new positions being created and so having to uh, understand how they kind of fit in the hierarchy of approvals and how to now work with these newly developed uh, teams. Right, thank you. <clears throat> Who's next? Who's willing? I'm Mary. I'm also from San Antonio. <laughs> and oh. uh, in the past, um, I had a pretty bad job experience. I was in a job where um, conflicts arose all the time, but we had a pretty dysfunctional work environment. And luckily, I'm in, in a bit of a better one, but um, I work with more people as, as opposed to when I did before. So um, that's what piqued my interest in this class seeing what I could have done in the past and going forward, what I can do in the future. Great, great. You're just starting on a journey with communication with this presentation. It's the tip of the iceberg. Who else? Hello. Nobody? Go ahead, Hello. Sashi. Thank Hi, you. I'm Sashi. Uh, just like Susan, I concluded my job search about a month ago. Ah. <laughs> So I made a transition from a corporation to a public sector. Right now I'm enjoying a different set of people. They're all nice to me for the moment, but because the different group dynamics, you, know, you never know what's going to happen. So I wanted to hear various examples out there and be prepared for something okay. that arises. Okay. Okay. 
I'm Tammy. I'm, an um, yes. I'm trying to become more of a project manager. And so that was kind of interesting to me because I have to work with so many different sets of people and just how do I handle that and like my professional development sense also. So, yeah. Great. Good for you. Looking into it. Thank you. Heather or Zia? Hi, I'm Zia. Hi. Um, I'm new to Austin and I'm actually new to the tech field. Um, Welcome to Austin. I am, yeah, thank you. Um, I'm actually here um, to develop better communication skills because now that I'm in tech and I know that it's a male dominated field, I want to make sure that I uh, speak and come across clearly and just present myself the way I'd like to be presented professionally in the workplace. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And Heather, you were in the last, you were with us. Is it the same Heather that was in with me last time? I guess she's not there. Okay. Well, the model that I use was actually created in the original writing about communication and what we use. Um, that's okay. We got a text there from Heather. She's having mic issues. That's fine. Thank you. So in Santa Cruz is where it started. A linguist and a mathematician started noticing that there were patterns that people had that they, the really good communicators did kind of the same things. Their quote unquote syntax, the way they structured their communication was successful and they repeated it. So they modeled it and they wrote about it and they taught us. And I learned it over 30 years ago, as I might have said, it's hard when you're doing the same thing that you just did. I wonder, did I just say that? <laughs> or was that in the other one? Anyway, um, the, the, the related question is about effective communication. Ultimately, that's what you want. And so, when I was with a company, I was recruited to come to a tech company. Does anybody ever hear of Tokyo Electron US Holdings? Okay, well, I was with them for 10 and a half years and we created a whole course for the leaders. And I believe everybody's a leader. You, the hardest person to lead, according to John Maxwell, who's a writer of about 27 books on leadership, is yourself. And so you're making the right move to learn things for yourself. And everybody has to lead something, whether it's a project or themselves or a team, we're all, we're all leaders in that respect. That's, that's my opinion. So at Tokyo Electron, talk about a, men, a man's world, 87% men. And probably this is an exaggeration because I'm just making it up. Probably 87% of them are engineers. Now, I'm generalizing and grossly overstating it, but engineers think differently than just your run of the mill, something else. They are jazzed by different things. They are motivated by different things. Um, so we're gonna address a few tools that'll start you thinking about how you communicate with somebody who's a little bit different than you. So the first thing we're going to do is look at current indicators from neuroscience. I told you, I think I'm, I'm a brain nerd and look at the reality or how your and our model of the world is created. The science is saying, neuroscience is saying, they're even using the word hallucination, that we make stuff up in our heads, that we create our reality. We can have observation and we can see something as fact or we can have interpretation. And we wildly use interpretation of the world around us. So we're gonna look at three patterns that if you kind of hit a, a bump in the road with a conversation, you'll be able to man maneuver, to keep the conversation open and to continue to have a beneficial conversation. And so we're gonna look at tips on handling certain patterns that could derail a conversation. 
So the brain predicts what the scene should look like and sound like around you. Does anybody know who Peter Senge is? He's an older writer that first came up with some of these models about how we experience reality. Now, Scientific American and Stanford University of Neuroscience and others are talking about what's in our head is not the same thing as what we think we're talking about sometimes. Now that sounds bizarre, doesn't it? How could you think my facts are wrong? Well, if we're talking about facts and concrete, that's one thing. If we're talking about opinions or interpretations, which we live in, uh, it kind of kind of get a little bit mixed up there, a little bit conflicting. So what we're gonna look at is some ways to gather more information about how the other person is seeing their world. If you can start where they are, if you can be with them in rapport in the different levels of communication, then it's gonna be a help for you. Most of us stick with the content or what we perceive to be the content. What my model, this model that I use, talks about the process or structure of communication. And I don't mean a declarative sentence or something like that, or a questioning sentence. It is the process of putting together things in your mind and understanding how people are putting them in theirs. So we are very prone, human beings, to misunderstand because we leave things out. We sometimes leave things out of our talk. So one of the first things I suggest to people to keep the conversation going is to stop using why. Let's do an experiment. Um, why would you do that? Why is this happening? Why didn't you? What kind of feelings come up when you hear that? Very defensive feeling. Like I need yeah. to defend my, my, what I did. Yeah, yeah, we do. And where's the first place we ever heard why? We were about two. Why'd you spill the milk? Oh, I just wanted to. No, we don't do that. What happens when you ask why two is you don't get quote unquote data or concrete information. You get justification, generalizations, People leave things out, deletions, distortions. You put things in. From our models of the world, we rearrange and our answer comes out not as clear as we would like it. So communication, first of all, is not that easy. There's so many moving parts. And if you want specific information, you'll need to use different strategic questions. So the first thing I suggest is omit why from your questioning. Have you ever heard of Toyota's 5Y model? Anybody? Well, they have this model where they look for the root cause, but everybody's looking for the root cause. They're not talking to each other. They're talking to figure out. So they're all asking the same question of the problem. That's when they're on the same page. So it's different than asking a person, well, why do you think that? With always, nearly always, a tone. So as I mentioned before, mental models are the patterns in our mind. And the person you're communicating with is definitely not necessarily having the same model. We all have different ones. And so it's going to be important to find with questions how they're thinking. I had a a person that was sent to coaching, his name was Mac, and he was a controller when he came to me and he was about to be fired. Nobody wanted to work for him. He said to me after he came to our workshop that he all of a sudden had an epiphany that where he learned to communicate as an adult was in law school. He was a lawyer for 15 years. He didn't tell me that initially. And here he is being a controller. Nobody wanted to work for him. He was going for the win. He wanted to win all the time and be the, you know, I'm generalizing about lawyers too. 
he's the one that talked about how his communication was destroyed by what they literally said to him. We're going to change the way you think in law school. So he learned everything he could learn from this book here and our workshop, Smart Work, The Syntax Guide to Influence, which I would encourage you to all get. Uh, and if you have any questions, give me a call. But it's, my, it's been my go-to since it was written. And it's in its second edition now. It gives you the structure of communication. You can tell by reading it. You can see by reading it where the potholes are. <laughs> What, where you're going to step in the mud if you do X. It was first created in uh, California, by the way, because the people at uh, Sun Microsystems, they're gone. Uh, all the, the early, early technology companies were not talking to each other. Like I think Lara mentioned that some, Laura, is it Laura or Lara? Lara? Laura. It's Laura. Thank you. Laura. Okay. I appreciate it. Um, so what they did was they started sharing some models that they had, the people who wrote about it, had observed that the good communicators did the same things. They did patterns. They did patterns that worked. So they discovered that there's a process or a structure or a pattern. I use all those words. And the communication that is structured, there's a structure that you do in your own world that, that is learned, like Mac. He learned it. He didn't grow up with it. They didn't teach it in school. He hadn't gone to any communication classes. And we get into those habits of pattern. And some work for us and some don't. So what we call that is our personal syntax. So... As you know, in coding and in sentence structure, there's uh, syntax. There's pieces that go together. And the patterns I'm gonna, some of the patterns I'm gonna show you will show you how to go from being stuck and maybe disagreeing to leading the person to think openly, to keep the conversation open. So the first one is frame one. You may have heard these questions in your project groups or in your workplace that, that you've been in. Some of you are new to workplaces, you have to wait. Okay, so the frame one starts out as, what's the problem? Why do you have it? Who or what is limiting you or us from preventing us from getting what we want. And whose fault is it? So I have some questions for you, if you will. What's your energy level with those questions, thinking of a problem that you may have? How do you feel about yourself in the situation? We would be doing an exercise if we were in person where you had experienced it more deeply. And what is your level of motivation Clarity about the situation or optimism? Who would give us a little bit of a feedback here? Diane, would you repeat the, the four elements? There you are. Or are you sharing them somewhere that I'm not seeing? Oh my God. They turned off my sharing the screen. Okay. Thank you for that question. No wonder you wondered about this. There we go. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh my gosh. That's crazy. So I'm, I'm telling you things that are on the slides. <laughs> oh, Lordy. Well, so to, to start, I think a couple of the questions are inviting but whose fault is it is a great way to shut things down. Yes, I agree with you. I agree with you. I'm trying to get this bigger so I can see everybody. Oops, in fact, I got it wrong here. Okay. So I don't know where the other people went. I guess they, I don't know. So thinking about 
the questions here on what kind of internal response you have. Are you optimistic about solving the problem? Or maybe not, no. It sounds overwhelming. Yeah, it does, it can get overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at the next frame, and we'll talk about how this goes with some of the, the groups of people we work with, what is your desired outcome? It's like, what do you want? What will you know? What will you see when you attain it? What possibilities might exist based on the current situation? What have we learned from the situation? Every conversation can be a learning conversation. So when your desired outcome is your aim, it's your goal. It's what you do want, not what you don't want. That's the difference here. How do these questions resonate with you now? Is there any difference? Is there any change? Yeah, so much better. This one is energizing and inspiring and forward looking. Thank you. Yes, Susan, you're absolutely right. The irony is, how many of you work with engineers like I did? Okay, I'm not sure why my picture has gone away. It says we've got nine participants, but I don't have them all. Oops, sorry technology. Let's go back to check one thing out. Well, now it's not moving. Now my slide's not moving. What is going on? This is crazy. Well, there we go. Got it loose. When you're working with engineers, they kind of get motivated by what's the problem. It doesn't mean they have to stay there, which is getting into the fault and prevention and geez, that won't work and that sort of thing. However, and again, I'm generalizing about engineers. They're not all like that. I worked with them. And so what you wanna do is start there, let them get into the problem a little bit and then go into frame two and lead them to keep the conversation open about possibilities. And we've got several sets of questions in smart work that can go with this, that can add to the conversation. So what happened when you changed the questions or the frame? You shifted from blame to aim. I had a couple that came to a workshop and they were business partners. And they'd been working together for six years. They really liked each other. They were very different. He was, mo he, their epiphany when they got in the workshop and had an experience of using these frames is they found that he was really into the problems. He wanted to fix the problem. That motivated him. Let's go get it. And she was creative and future oriented and imagined possibilities. So they were talking totally different languages, which I thought was pretty amazing. She was always into creative solutions. And once they found that, and they found that they were stuck somewhere, they could break that up and move on. The last little piece is something you probably do sometimes. We need to do it more. We need to verify for understanding. We need to verify what we learned, what we understood, what's in our model of the world. Does it match their model of the world? If we're making it up or if we're hallucinating like science is saying, we need to check things out. So you say things like, do you mean? So what you're asking me to do is, and you confirm it. What I understand you to say is, is that right? And let me recap what I think we've agreed to so far. Do I have it? All right. So those are some of the things that can help us 
keep the conversation open. Have you ever had somebody, you don't have to say who, just shut down, just shut down because they don't want to talk about it anymore because you're not going anywhere. No hands need to be raised, but I bet you've had one. I've been that person. I've been that person. That was a nice confession. Yes. Okay. There's one other thing that I'd like to talk about that I wonder if you've ever done or had anybody do this with you. Do you have anybody in your life who, when you start either figuring out the problem or going for the aim frame, going to what you do want to do, their first response is, yes, but have you ever heard that? Yeah, it's pretty frequent in my world. I've heard it. I have one, actually a good friend. The first thing she does is no. She just says no. And so we have to wait and, and look at some other possibilities first because she's got to go think about it. So everybody has their own way of doing it. And the yes, but should be replaced or can be replaced with yes and. What happens when you say yes, but to the conversation, to the person? What is the result, do you think, in terms of their feeling it or the behavior? Yes. It what? It negates the yes. It negates the yes. It erases whatever sounded like you were agreeing with. You're right. Absolutely. So you can practice. You can try out saying yes and. Has anybody heard that before? Occasionally, people hear about that these days. So what I would wonder is if you ever say yes, but. It is so common in our language. You don't have to answer. I'm just saying it is so common in how we talk because we're shifting gears. We're saying, yes, but let's go this way. However, to Zia's point, it erases what people are talking about. So I would invite you to really look at and practice and become self-aware of when you say it. You can be in charge of your personal syntax and if that's in it, it needs to be put aside. It needs to be put aside. So what questions might you have about communication about specific topics since we have some extra time. And they gave us more time and I had it scheduled for the other time. <laughs> I have a question. Great. Uh, so how do you, when the conversation goes um, into that um, direct, we're gonna solve the problem. Why, who, yes. what? Um, and it gets into that, you know, everybody's quiet because no one wants to talk <laughs> with the person asking those questions. As a right. leader, how can I direct it to a healthy conversation? What you can do is you can pattern, let me go back up here. You can pattern it after. Okay, they start here. Is that what you're saying? They start yeah. at the, the problem and all that. And whose fault is it? Yeah. Well, as you're, you're building rapport with the person, and answering them and respecting what they're saying, you can also sneak in with, well, what are we trying to get to here? What's our real, what's the big picture of the outcome? I mean, this is a short little sentence, but you can take it and put it in your own language. Okay, so uh, we're, all, we're all going for the same goal, and I think it's X, or, and is that correct? So you can use verify within this, and then, how will we know, I should have put we instead of you, how will we know if we get there? What's it gonna, how is that project gonna look different? How are people gonna be interacting with XYZ if we are successful? What are we gonna be hearing from people? And what possibilities might exist based on our current situation? Okay, we've described a situation and so you want to ask them to look outside of the limit of this is the way it is. 
if they're talking about, ah, oh, we got to do this, and this is the only this is the only square box we can play in, then you want to ask something that opens that thinking up, that kind of prods them to think about possibilities. And you can, like I said, you can change these words so they're not just pat questions. What other things might help us? Okay. And then so far, what have we learned that isn't working and that is working? So you'll ask other questions to get the thoughts going in different directions, inviting other people in and keeping the conversation open because that's the goal. You wanna be able to keep the conversation going and not pe have people shut down because then you're not going to have any input. Right. Yeah, definitely. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I just don't know where my picture went. So uh, I appreciate your staying on. All right. What other questions do you have? Because what I'd like to say is this is a summary of what we've been talking about. You want to avoid why down here. And ask questions like what, how, which, when, and where. That doesn't shut people down or make them defensive, typically. And always remember, how many of you had any kind of classes in rapport building with body language and tonality and that sort of thing? I see some heads and I see some heads. Some yes, some no. So I would invite you to, again, Read smart work, because if you're in sync with someone, let me ask you this. How many of you dance? Partner dance. Yeah. You have, somebody leads and somebody follows, right? What's the same in a conversation? So if you can get in sync with a person, then you can lead them to the more positive frame. You can align with them and then lead to what you want to talk about the possibilities, the outcomes that we share, the goals that we share. And verifying, not only does it verify what's being said, it affirms that you're listening to the person. You may not have gotten it, but you know enough to ask the question, help me understand. And that's one of the most useful questions there is. Help me understand a little bit more about what you're saying. So. That's what I call meeting the person where they are to try to learn their mental model. Okay. So that's called personal syntax. When you learn yours and you learn theirs, and you can manage it. You can change from yes, but to yes. And if that's something that we habitually get into, I mean, we hear it on TV and we hear it everywhere. Who else has a question about your world that you have now or a, a problem that you were faced with or a story you can tell us? Thank I you, Susan. A, sure, I, I have a question. Um, how would you shift this guidance when you're trying to facilitate resolution between two other people? So you're not a participant in this disagreement, but you may be the mediator. Right. Well, actually I was in HR in employee relations. So I got the opportunity to do that a lot, to mediate between people. And I basically, I had this two, I had this two people. It was a boss and somebody he was getting ready to fire. And he came in to tell me why the, the boss did and brought the, employee with him. And as I heard them conversing, they were both in different frames. They were like Liz and Ben, who thought about things very differently. And I actually pointed out each of their personal syntax to the both of them. And they saw that they were thinking differently, which took it up a level in the conversation, as opposed to you're wrong. No, you're wrong. No, 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 no. Pointing fingers and, and carrying on like that. And the guy, the boss sat there and he ripped up the paper he brought in to say he's going to fire this guy. 
I mean, they changed their mind. He saw that there was something that they could work on. So when you have, have two people that are incongruent, try to find their patterns. And you have to, you can learn this. You can get it so that it's going to be an unconscious competence that you'll have it. Like I, I've been working on it for years and, and it's easy to learn. And you just practice it like Mac did one chunk at a time. So he would go back to his people that weren't listening to him and weren't cooperating with him. And he would say, well, help me understand, which is something he never said. Help me understand what the problem is here. You know, he would use rapport. He would talk to them with respect. He would not try to be right all the time. Does that make sense? Great, great. Anybody else? We have exactly three minutes. Anybody else has a, com a question or a comment? I had a question um, or I guess a scenario where I would maybe describe my syntax as emotional and my managers as not, or maybe I'm unable to maybe identify what his is. And it's harder okay. with being on, uh, being remote, right? And not being able to oh, see yeah. facial expressions or read body language. Oh, um, yes. I really only got to know him for two weeks or something before we left the office. So um, it's been difficult, especially during these times where I maybe have a mid-year check-in or an annual review when I really start honing in onto that emotional side of my syntax where it's talking about well-being and it's talking about things other than just my day-to-day -day work. Um, kind of maybe what are your suggestions on ways that I can maybe read his syntax and or figure out the best way to, I guess, also make it easy so that way we can communicate to each other and I can get my point across. Well, help me understand just a little bit here on what you mean about the emotional side, the well-being. You talk to your person that you're referencing about right. how you're feeling and right. uh, what you need. Is this somebody you directly report to? Yes. Is it a male or a female? A male. Okay. And what is his uh, response when you talk about feelings? I, I don't really get a response. Or I, a lot of times I get silence. So I end up filling it with my own speak. And then it just kind of gets to a point where there's nothing more for him to really say. Okay. Well, one of the things I would suggest, and I don't know who's talking, but <clears throat> that's okay. Um, one of the things that I think is operating here is that men have been taught, socialized, not to show their emotions or talk about their emotions, and they're, I'm generalizing, uh, a bit uncomfortable with them. Mm -hmm. And it may not be something that he can respond to. And you may want to listen to him when he's talking whether he stays with uh, kind of the facts, nothing but the facts, you know, right. that kind of thing. And if so, then you're out of sync by sharing your emotions. Right. If you say something less emotional and say, I believe that I am being omitted from these meetings, that's more of a fact that he can take and figure out how that's happening. Does okay. that make sense? I mean, yes. with, with not many moving parts here in my story, I mean, in your story, I'm not quite certain. I'm, just have, I'm betting because he's male and socialized mm -hmm. that um, you'll need to even make requests. I would like to make a request that I get included in those project meetings. I have somebody who's working on there right now. She was always being left out. Mm -hmm. And then she was out of touch. She, was, she didn't know what some of the things were that she needed to work on. And this was a vice president woman in a big company and she was being omitted. So she had to learn to speak up in a non-emotional way instead of crying, because she right. did do that. Um, and oops, they're saying we have to leave the breakout room. Did that help? It did, thank you. Oh, good, okay. Good luck with that, thank you.